Hello everyone, welcome to a new coaching session for Marvel Snap Zone Premium members. I think this is number 10, if I'm not mistaken. First milestone, we're getting into the two digits. I'm very happy that uh, people are enjoying it and uh, we were able to make this a regular thing. Uh, today's team is a little different from usual because we're not necessarily going to talk about uh, changes or metagame too much because unfortunately I will not be uh, available after the OTA happened this week. So we had to do it a little earlier, so I took a, a topic from someone who suggested it, which is going to be about mapping. So when we say mapping, usually we talk about mapping or turns, which is uh, the act of trying to anticipate what we want to do in the game based on what's in our hand and the various information we can get. But actually, we can t take this even further and try to map out games even when we're not actually playing one. We, we can map out games just looking at a deck and thinking, all right, this is how this deck wins. And this is how this deck wants to play. Um, and then in the game, if what we plan for happens, we just make it happen. And if what we and what we plan for didn't happen, then we have to adapt and find solutions. So uh, before we get started, is everyone comfortable with the previous notions that we explored? Everyone remember what a tech, what core is, what flex is? uh what a power turn is or this kind of terminology i'm not sure i know the power term but other than that okay i think i'm pretty comfortable uh all right so a power turn is literally what's the name the name is saying it's a turn that is particularly powerful for a certain deck for example a lockjaw a lockjaw deck his power turn is on turn 3 because this is where he plays Lockjaw. Um, if I would take, I don't know, the, the current low-key collector deck, a power turn is playing collector on turn 2. So, like These are turns that represent uh, your deck like doing what you planned for, basically. like You built a deck and you were like, okay, my deck wants to do this, this, and this, and your power turns are the most important turns in that strategy, usually because they're the most important ones and because they set you up for the rest of the game. Uh, Perfect. I could have another example like the, the Doom Wave kind of decks. The power turn is Wave on 5. So it's just a turn that is particularly powerful. All right. So before I forget, like every single time, we are going to share screen. Uh, I'm going to share my left screen. And we're going to look at this scheme, which is basically... How a deck is built. So we have a deck on the left, and the deck is divided into three pieces. We have the core, we have the flex, and we have the tech. For this time, the tech we can just kind of ignore it because this is a specific part of mapping which only happens in certain matchups. Um, for now, we're going to focus on our deck, so the things that we're trying to do all the time. Usually, our core is going to tell us our first game plan, which we're going to name Game Plan A. This is the thing that we want to do almost all the time. And in this game plan, we're going to have a certain number of uh, power turns, which are going to be representative uh, of our game plan. Then, with the flex cards, we can either bring some support to that game plan. So, for example, if my power turn A happens, I have a card that is a great follow-up to this. Um, or if my power turn B happens, I have a card that helps it and supports it and uh, helps it make it as powerful as power turn A, which I probably missed if I had to go to B. Stuff like this. Uh, otherwise, the flex can also be a second game plan. Um, with 12 cards, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, but for example, like if we look at uh, Galactus currently, uh, the deck is playing Electro, and so a lot of the times you also see the deck playing cards like Professor X, uh, the Goblins, 
uh, nebula, sunspot, these kind of things. And so sometimes you have a game plan B where you just go nebula, daredevil, electro on the same lane, and you just aim to play profix on that lane, and you just won that lane, and then you have something like Chavez, Orca, uh, Obgoblin, these kind of things to try and win a second lane. And so you have a, a game plan that is completely different from just trying to play Galactus, and that game plan naturally has different power turns. All right, up until this point, are we okay? Yes, we are good. Okay, this is where we're going to get into the interesting part. In order to have a power turn, we need to play cards, because that's what we do in card games, we play cards. And we already talked about it when we talked about the limitations. When we play a card, we actually have to pay that card. We pay it with energy, but we also pay it with space on the board. We have a limited amount of space. And we also pay it with a slot in our deck. The game gives us 12 slots. If we want to play a card, we have to give up one of those 12 spots. And these are all the limitations which are like associated with playing a card. So if I go back to my scheme before, every time I want to set up a power turn, that means I am limiting what I can do. And usually, because there's only six turns in the game, you can only have six power turns. But if you manage to have six power turns, you probably created the best deck in the history of the game. Because that means you only have strong turns. That means you have like no setup, no nothing. You just keep developing power. And when that kind of deck happens, usually it gets nerfed really, really fast. Um, so usually you have either a few power turns, which are all connected, or you have a few power turns, which open different game plans. So today I wanted to keep the tier report really small because I think it's much easier to understand if we get um, examples, if we actually do it practically. We're going to go on the last tier list, and we're just going to do that on the decks of the current metagame. Uh, okay, so we're four people, so we're going to do, we're going to do one each, and probably like two rounds or something like that. So, I'll take the first one, and what's nice in Marvel Snap is that uh, because the decks are really small, the name of the deck usually tells you a lot about what the deck is trying to do. So, for example, Shuri Sauron. Well, there are two power turns, Shuri on four and Sauron on three. And these kind of power turns are what we call setup turns. Like, if I do Sauron on three or if I do Shuri on four, I know my deck is going to be exceptionally good. These are not the cards which are responsible for the points, as if I play Shuri and I don't play anything else, my deck is really bad. But these are the cards that make my deck function and make my deck extremely strong. Then I could just talk about like good turns, like Nebula on turn one is really good. Uh, Armor or Lizard on turn two are decent. Uh, Vision or Red Skull behind Shuri are great. Copying either of those with Taskmaster is also great. Um, yet, if I remove Sauron or Shuri from the equation, this is where my deck loses the most. So, my power turns are Sauron and Shuri. And because my power turns are Sauron and Shuri, as you can see, these are the turns where I have the least alternatives. I have 3 1 costs, I have 2 2 costs, I have 3 5 costs, and I have 1 6 cost, which can never miss, so I have actually an infinity of 6 cost because I know I always have a 6 to play, and Taskmaster is usually a second 6. But only have one, f one tree and two fours, because every time I'm going to have Sauron, I'm going to play Sauron. And every time I have Shuri, I'm going to play Shuri. While on turn 1, I am fine playing Nebula, but I'm also fine playing 0, especially if I have Lizard to follow up. Turn two is kind of the same thing. If I have already Shuri and I know where I'm going to play it, armor is fine. But if I don't have that information, I can default to Lizard. Turn five is kind of the same thing. Behind Shuri, 
whether I play Vision or Red Skull is not that important. Like, it makes a difference in points, but both cards are really good. And they both make good targets for Taskmaster. So, if I just break down the strategy of the deck, I can see what's flexible, and I can see what is not. And usually what is not flexible is because I don't have something that... Like, I don't have anything that contributes to my deck success as much as these cards. So most of the time, if you spot your opponent's a Shuri deck, and on turn 4 they're not doing Shuri, you might snap just based on this, because you know their deck is not, supposed what, is not doing what it's supposed to do. So when I'm deck building with this deck, once I have like Shuri and Sauron, I'm actually filling all the other turns, because I don't see a point into finding alternatives on 3 and 4, because if I don't have these cards, my deck is not going to function anyway. There are plenty of really good trees, like, and there are plenty of really good fours in the game. It's just, for the purpose of this deck, nothing compares to Shuri and Sauron. And this, like, once I understand this about the deck, it maps out my turns really easily, because suddenly I have... Am I still streaming the right thing? Yes! Um, because... Once I understand this, I know what is flexible and I know what is not flexible in my deck. I know that I can build various one costs. So for example, I know that Nebula doesn't have much synergy with a lot of cards, so it could be flexible. I know zero has synergy with Lizard Red Skull, but it could be changed for another one cost that would just slam on one for times so I don't have Lizard. And I know Ebony Maw is decent early on, but it's mostly in the deck because Sauron's ability. Same thing for the two costs. Lizard is in the deck because Sauron's ability. Armor is in the deck because Shuri's ability makes the card very weak to Shang-Chi. Ifoid is in the deck because Sauron. Taskmaster is in the deck because Shuri. Vision is in the deck because Shuri. Red Skull is in the deck because both Shuri and Sauron. And America Chavez is in the deck because I want Shuri and Sauron as much as possible, and that card makes it like, makes those cards happen more often. Does that all make sense? Probably this last, I don't know, 30 seconds or a minute was like the most of, or the best I've ever learned about uh, deck building. Great. Well, should have asked earlier, we would have done this day one. All right. Are you guys ready to do the same? Who wants to go first? Uh, it's it's a pretty simple one. It, it's similar to Shuri Soran. Bishop, would you like to go? Yeah. So we just wanted to go over why the how the which are kind of identify the parts. Basically, what we want to do is what we already did in the past. We want to identify which cards are core, which cards are flex, and the core is going to tell us which turns are flexible and which turns are not flexible most of the time. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Like I said, my audio may not be super compatible with this, but I'll do what I can. Um, so based on the name, like, obviously we're going to go with Hela and Tribunal as core, um, with, as those both will, they are going to define everything we do in the deck. Um, Invisible Woman uh, Invisible Woman is a setup piece um, as and would maybe considered a power turn because it allows you to set up Hella if you um, if you don't have the Modoc yet or you're counting on Modoc late. Um, or to hide Hella, excuse me, it's a power trick, you have to hide Hella behind Modoc. Um, with magic also being considered an important power piece because it gets Hella out ahead of Modoc. Um, flex pieces, I would argue, would be Crystal, 
Um, and any of your large pieces like Infinite and Giganto. Um, and Chavez, of course, to force, force your draw so that you get Hella out, or you get Hella in hand, and Modoc in hand when you need it. Um, and of course, Modoc is another power piece since it's required to uh, activate, or it's required before you can activate Hella, so it falls into the same position as Shuri does in the previous deck. Um, and I think everything else with Onslaught, um, Iron Man, uh, Iron Lad are more flexible and can be used. They could, you could do other things with them. And Crystal is probably the least, I would say maybe the least important card in the deck, although it does function as the same way um, Chavez does, is to help you increase your draw. Okay, so if you've identified the role of each card, which turns are not like which turns are not negotiable with this deck? Which turns so, are I want to play this at this point in the game? Um, so Hella is going to be Hella on six is unless there's a unless there's a way to play Hella on four on um, five you have to play Hella on six uh, because we only have one turn left to play Modak on. Um, <laughs> However, if you have Invisible Woman out, Invisible Woman has to be played obviously before um, Modoc and Hella. So if you have Invisible Woman, you can hide Modoc behind Invisible Woman on five. That makes Modoc an important play on five. If you don't, if you don't have the room for, if you're not already into a Magic pose, um, Magic would have to be put. I guess. So it's either, it, I guess it's maybe the orders and turn, not specifically the turn, right? So it's either Modoc 5, Hella 6, or in, um, 6, Hella, Modoc 7, if you got Invisible Woman out. Okay, that so, all? so which, like, which turns are non-flexible? Um, Let's just try to identify the turns where we can't uh, really work... Like and try to overthink stuff. Like, which turns are we like? If I have this card, I'm just gonna play it. Uh, we can try Bimo and Hella. <laughs> okay. So which turns are those? So turn six in regard to that, and turn seven. Okay. So these are or unflexible turns. But the thing is, what if I don't have magic? All right, so you don't have turn seven then. So therefore, magic on turn. So th this is where I struggle because I would argue that you, this is where I guess I see apprehension. Magic's obviously a turn three, so if you have magic on three, you want to play it. But magic's just as good on turns four and turns four as well, right? You have some flexibility there. Yeah, so magic is not a power turn, but it opens another one. But like. So what? Turn. But let's say you tell me my power turns are six and seven. Does that mean whenever I don't have magic, my deck doesn't work? No. Okay, then if I don't have magic, it's... what can my deck do? So Invisible Woman on two would be a power turn. Thus, you only have one two drop. Okay. And then, what am I doing with my other turn? So three is flexible. Okay. Right. Four is it flexible? Four is flexible. Okay, very five. flexible. What is five? Five is if Invisible Woman is out. Five is Modoc. Okay. If, is, oh, it's just not true. What is well, six? I guess that's what, six has got to be Hella or okay. Modoc, right? Depending on the order, or six is Hella or Giganta. I mean, excuse me, or tri Tribunal. Well, if you play Modoc on five, your six has to be Ella. Yeah. Right. Okay. So your power turns actually are 5 and 6, or 6 and 7, mm -hmm. or 5, 6, and 7, because you also have the Iron Man Onslaught Tribunal line. Right. So if we go back to this yeah, yeah. here, the Shuri Sauron yeah. deck was only one game plan. It was like, play Sauron, play Shuri, and if he doesn't do that, just get out of here. The Hella Tribunal deck is a double game, game plan deck. So we have game plan A, which is Invisible Woman, Modoc, Ella. 
where the power turns are true, like 2, 5, and 6. But we also have the game plan B, which is the Living Tribunal game plan, which is Iron Man, Onslaught, Living Tribunal. And then the power turns are 5, 6, and 7. Does that make sense? Got it. So, now that we know this, that means I'm going back to my deck building, because my goal is actually to use this information when I'm building my deck. Invisible Woman I cannot touch. Iron Man I cannot touch. Modok I cannot touch. Ally I cannot touch. Onslaught I cannot touch. Living Tribunal I cannot touch. And once I realize one of my power turns is a 7, I can't touch magic as well. So now, which cards can I change if I ever wanted to include a new one? Crystal, Iron Lad, possibly Chavez. And Giganto and Infinite. Okay, so I have five slots. But now let's go even deeper. I said my power turns are five, six, and seven. And Invisible Woman I can play on two, three, or four. Doesn't change much. And Magic is the same. I can play on, on three or four. So they're not locking. But that means if I was to include another card in the deck that I intend to play, not if I intend to discard it with Hela, like just play whatever you want because the power doesn't exist, uh, the cost doesn't exist. But if I was to include a card that I intend to actually play, it's a card that needs to cost four or less because if it costs five, I'm not going to play it. I already have better stuff to do. Got it. All right. So for, for the next ones, let's, let's try to keep it as simple as possible. Because I feel like right now, at least what Bishop did was he had a lot of information, but he kind of got lost in the middle of it. The idea is just to keep the important information. Like what we're trying to find is where are we flexible? Like what can we impact in our deck and what can we not touch? So we're just trying to identify that, not necessarily explain the full deck and how it plays and the locations and everything. All right, who wants to take Loki Collector? That's the most could, difficult one, probably. I was going to say, I could try this one just because I do think it's really hard to yeah. map it onto this. This, this is extremely hard to map. Um, I mean, there, there's something like, I don't know, half a dozen... Alternatives. Um, I would say turn two is important because you can either get collector out, and if you don't have collector, um, Angela. Okay. So um, we have two really good cards on two. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got Quinjet on one or Kitty Pride on one, they're both great ones. Um, but I wouldn't say either are necessary um, at that point. Um, and then, from there, this is tricky for a couple reasons. One, a lot of the cards do basically the same thing. Like, Cable and Mirage have similar functions, right? Snowball um, well. but Agent that's right. as well. Uh, <laughs> you could put them all in the same bag. That's right. But then what makes this extra tricky is that what you're drawing with those cards could actually on-the-fly change what ends up being a power turn for you. Yes. So, the idea is... We're not going to go into flexible power turns because, I mean, mm -hmm. it's up to you as a pilot to spot those and be able to adapt. Like, unfortunately, I cannot teach you how to adapt to whatever situation you're going to face. Mm -hmm. um, but all right, y you're on the right track. So which turns are not flexible? Because in the end, this deck like looks complicated, but it's kind of simple what you understood, mm -hmm. what you exactly said. So, which turns are not flexible? Because there are cards that, if we have them, we're going to play them. Um, so, you can have a turn that's not flexible, but there's two alternatives that you'd have to play in that turn. Okay. Yeah, then like, I would say... Like, a power turn isn't necessarily one mm -hmm. card. It's more Perfect. of a... If I had one or one of these options, I'm going to go with those. Mm -hmm. um, then I think turn two, and uh, with Loki it's tricky, I could see an argument for either four or five, but let's say five. 
Um, two and five, I would say. Because by five, you have to be executing either a Loki plan or um, Legion as a backup. And if you don't do either of those, um, it's not clear where the okay. deck is heading, unless you've got an alternative from the draws. So I'd say maybe two and five, but four is really persuasive, even three is persuasive. I would have said one and two. Ah, okay. Like okay. If you have Kitty Pride or Quinjet, you're slamming either of them. And the thing mm -hmm. is, as you said, this deck's goal is to generate cards, right? Mm -hmm. What is the one turn where you didn't have time to generate? Turn one. Turn one. Yeah. So yeah. if it's not possible to have generated cards on turn one, you have to play cards from the deck. That's right. So the thing I is, see. like, in that way, turn one is never flexible for that kind of deck. Because... It was really good, yes, you spotted. The flexibility doesn't come from the deck. It comes from certain cards in the deck which are going to give you flexibility that you have to adapt. But that means this flexibility only unlocks once you play those cards. I see. So, so until there's... the point oh. <laughs> where you can play those cards, consider the deck unflexible because he hasn't reached that point. Mm -hmm. So now that you know this... What is the first turn where you might have new options? Probably three. Yep. That means one and two are not flexible. Three, four, five, six are. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So that there's means... kind of a couple. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, no, for... no, no. Please, just, please. It's funny because I, I haven't taken this deck with my stripper deck. It took me very. It, it was very obvious to me real quick that. If the Quinjet was on one, if I Killmonger on three, the deck just shut down. Um, so I didn't hold the Killmonger looking for anything else. I just shut the deck down and then beat it. Yeah. That's because this is one of the parts of the deck which are not flexible. If they have Quinjet, they want it on board. And a lot of people, if they get Quinjet on one, Collector on two, they're going to snap you with this deck. Because that's exactly what they want to do. Because they got Power Turn into Power Turn. So what, what were you going to say, Silverman? Oh, I was just going to say part of what's interesting here is that there's kind of a couple different meanings of um, an inflexible turn. One is um, it's, you know, if you've got this card, you can't play anything else. Um, but the other one is if you don't have this card by this turn, your deck's performance starts to degrade pretty rapidly. Um, and what's interesting about Loki is one and two is a power turn in the first definition. But with the second definition, if I don't have Kitty or Quinjet on the first turn, there's still a chance that this will put out an incredible number of points because it's such a chaotic deck. So it's, it's kind of interesting how this one comes apart. Yeah, and this is why, like I said, I can't really teach you how to be flexible because every deck has a different definition of being flexible. Mm -hmm. Depending mm -hmm. on your game plan your game plan can be flexible in different directions. Is your flexibility based on locations? Is your flexibility based on cards? Is your flexibility based on which cards are you drawing? Like there are decks which have legitimately like four different game plans and your flexibility is just pick the right game plan depending on the opponent. Other decks have one game plan like this one, but that one game plan can lead you to an infinity of possibility because that one game plan is get random cards. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. It's important to understand what is the deck good at in terms of flexibility. And then once you identify where the flexibility is, you also identified where it isn't. And here, if you really wanted to argue, you could say, but Snowguard can generate cards on turn one, so I could be flexible on turn two. Yes, but unless something incredibly specific happens, if you have Snowguard on one, you're never going to play either Ock or Bear if you have Collector on two, except maybe one location in the entire game into one specific matchup. So usually, the first big choice with your deck is going to come down on turn three. And that's going to be, do I play Cable, Mirage, Loki, Coulson, Snowguard, Jeff? Uh, do I want to invest into Kitty? Uh, I already played Collector. Do I think I have time to play Angela as well? This is, this is where the questions are coming in. On turn one, I have one question. Do I have Quinjet? Yes, no. 
I don't have Quinjet. <laughs> All right, do I have Kitty? Yes, no. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm such a good player. And turn two is the same. Do I have Collector? Yes, no. I don't have Collector. All right, do I have Angela? Yes, no. Like, this is not being flexible. While on turn three, all right, who am I playing against? Is it a deck that I want to low-key early on to be able to play a lot of cards, or do I just want to play them on play low-key on turn five so I get a lot of cheap cards? Do I want cards from their hand and boosted, or do I want a card from their deck that they're not going to draw? Uh, do I want to play a lot of small cards, or do I want to play Agent Coulson, which is going to give me bigger cards? I already have Legion in my hand. Do I want to seize priority so I can play Legion on five and play a different game plan than Loki? These are flexible questions. These are pushing me to think and to adapt. Do I have Quinjet or not doesn't push me to anything. It's just, can I read? All right, not for long. Are you with us for Evolve Doomwave? Yep. All right. Tell us everything. Um, so I guess the first thing is looking at core cards. And I think the main core cards are Sunspot, Wave, and High Eva. All right. Remember what I said with Shuri Soran about the title of a deck tells you a ton of things. Okay. I, would you count Doom as. L- literally, a... read, the te- read the title. <laughs> what does yes. Evolve mean? Uh, high evolutionary. All right. What does Doom Wave mean? Doom and Wave. All right. We got a core. Okay. Like, sometimes it's not that hard. Like, sometimes just take the information that they're giving to you and then think, all right, is it enough or not? Can you define this deck with it's a high evolutionary synergy with Wave and Doom in it? Yeah, that sums up pretty much everything we'll be doing. Or at least trying. Then we're good. We don't need to confuse people with more information. Okay. Like, the idea of all this is that we want to get as much information as possible, but not reach a point where there's so many that we're going to lose the important one. Like, when you're in a game, you have to think about the locations, you have to think about your opponent, you have to think about the draw, you have to think about a lot of things. If you come with a full head already, where are you going to fit all that information? You need to come with a head that has information, but also space for everything that the game is going to throw at you. So if you come with your full head, you're not going to have any, like, brain space to think about the locations, think about the matchup, think about counter cards and all that. So we want to go in with literal information, but super precise information that tells me as much as possible. Okay. All right, so we got the core. Now, what are we looking for? Um, so the... First power turn that I can think of is five to okay. play with. All right. Do we have auto power turns? Six. Yes. That is where we're playing Doom and Halt. Yes. So or, first you identify a power turn that's flexible and one that is not flexible. Yes. That's, that's already interesting. Like my five is always the same. My six can change. Yeah, changing for the matchup in the board, that yep. makes sense. Um, I think the only other power turn is turn one. Okay, why? Because to have the deck function, we want to play a cheap card and start loading energy. Are you 100% about this? Like, are you 100% if you have a turn one, you're always going to play it? Actually, no, now that I'm thinking about it, because sometimes it's better to soak energy with Hulk. Yes, but there is one power turn on one, not all of them. I think Nebula can be considered a power turn, because the assumption is if I play her one turn early, I get, po- I get two on Nebula. Instead of getting two on Hulk, I get two on Nebula. And as you said, my six is flexible. Maybe... I'm not going to play Hulk and I'm going to play Doom. While if I have Nebula and I play it, it's there. So you could make the point where you say the two points on Nebula are more likely to happen than the two points on Hulk. Okay. 
okay, yep. And and you're just trying to count points in this deck, so. So that makes sense. But for example, if it's Sunspot, you play Sunspot on one. So you played a one zero. Where, like, so right now you paid one to get zero points when Hulk was like, well, you could pay one to get two points. So unless you're passing more energy in the future, your Sunspot was really not worth playing. Yeah, so the, that would make sense then. Just thinking of the one drops, but with the Hulk in the deck, that the one energy is worth more. Than just playing the one drop. Yes. Do we have other power turns? Are there turns where we're like, if I have this, I'm gonna do this? Not necessarily 100% of the time, but a lot of the time. The turn for Cyclops is the yes. only thing I can think of. Yeah, definitely. So that means we have established power turns on 4, 5, and 6. So, if we know this, when's the flexible part with this deck? Turns 1, 2, 3. Yep. So, this deck is really simple to understand. Early game is flexible, late game is not. So, yeah. <laughs> so now that, that we it. have now that we have this information, it took us a little bit of time, but now we have like one sentence that tells us the whole deck. It's a high Evo synergy with Doom and Wave in it, and early it's flexible, late it's not. Like you could literally say that to someone and they should have enough to play the deck. So now we're gonna go back to our deck building process and if we could change the deck, like if we were looking to include new cards, where would you, where would we be looking? Um, mainly different one drops. Um, the armor, Jeff, and Mister Fantastic. Yes. Which exactly. Is, yeah, the whole. I mean, I think Sunspot, Nebula, and probably Misty are pretty. Or I guess Sunspot and Misty are pretty set for this build, but the other four. Uh, could be anything as long as it can be played in those turns. Yep. Exactly. I I think also your six drops, right? Because you can you can modify your six drops if there's a better card out there for the meta. Yeah, but your six would still remain a power turn. Like the difference between the early game, which is flexible, where we can literally like remove a card for another ability that we like or for a certain matchup. Or six needs to be a card that we're gonna play often. That that's the big difference. Like there's many more conditions as to which turn six we're gonna play. It needs to be good and it needs to be good enough to be played alone after we wave. It needs to be good in a setup with priority most of the time, because we're looking to have priority into turn 5. And it needs to be able to be played a lot of the time, because our goal is always to go wave into a 6. While our turn 1, 2, and 3, we don't have all those conditions attached to it. Yeah. Alright, that was the trial run. Are you ready for the real run? All right. Uh, ooh. Okay. Uh, who wants to pick first? I'll I'll take the remaining deck. I'm gonna have to go at noon, so can, in a uh, 15 minutes. So can I go first? Of course. Which deck do you want? Um. Do we have Cerebro, the Patriot, Inchinot, or Move. Let's try the um. Let's try the, either the Patriot or the Move Legend. Those are the two I'm probably the most f familiar with. Well, we're on the move, so let's take the move. I'll, let's do this one then. Okay. All right, so... So Power Turn's going to be Legion. Um, I mean, er, er, so the most important cards are going to be, of course, Legion. So that would apply a Power Turn on five. Okay. Um, and since we're going to use the word move... Um, I'm going to go with power turn is two with, uh, um, um, why is it, with uh, 
Paven. Okay. Um, and that's going to be your line. I think Kurgan's your line A. So I like that. Um, okay. So, so power, we have power so turns I, I on five and two. I agree. Okay. Um. So let's see. Next would be. The line B is going to be the Angela. Um, so that would be a second choice. So that, so that makes that consistent that Ange- the uh, two is still your power turn. Yep. Um, you have flexible turns. I think one is definitely, well, you only have one card in there and you almost don't care about it. So one is definitely your most flexible turn. Um, four is also flexible because you have lots of two drops and you also have some fours to play in there. Uh, you need to set up, ideally you want to set up fighter, uh, M- Morales, so that gives you a little more, it, it, there's a flexible turn on three, but you're planning, you're going to plan to, uh, you could argue that that's, uh, that four, uh, yeah, I guess you could argue that that's a power turn as well, but, um, because you really want to set Morales up before then. So, yeah, but th- then that's not a power turn. That's a setup turn. Setup turn. Okay. So I'll leave it at that. Two and five are power turns. Um, one, three, and four become more flexible. Okay. Then now let's circle back to deck building. That means if I was to change cards in the deck, where would I, which cards would I be looking to replace? Um, your... Pretty much your two drops, except for um, Angela and Craven. Uh, your one drop is completely you can come and go as you please. Yes. Um, and then six drops you have some room with because it, you know Doom and Chavez are both there for other reasons. Um, and then Shang Chi is complete tech, and so is Spider Man. Well, Spider Man is move synergy, but also techish. Okay. So I can't touch Shang-Chi? Mm. No, Shang-Chi is pure tech, so it can definitely go with the meta. Okay. That was pretty good. Um, one thing I would have liked, a little little thing, is that if you mentioned that Wave and Doom actually go together. Right, okay. Like, if you remove one, there's a very big chance you're going to want to remove the other one. Correct. So I see. And they weren't in the deck before until yeah. Doom fixed itself. It's what we call so. a flex pack. There are flex cards alone, flex packs, several cards. Got it. And Wave acts as like kind of a second legion. Like it's another way to, lo- to lock the game. So like if you're missing your power turn number one, you can still go to power turn number two, which would be like Wave plus a two, Wave plus Morales, something like that, into Doom. It like as we saw here, it opens game plan B. And oftentimes, this is where it's fun. You establish some power turns in game plan A, and if you look at game plan B, very often you're gonna see that these are the exact same turns because we want to keep the same rhythm for the deck. That makes sense. All right. Uh, who wants to go second? I'm happy to try the Cerebro deck. All right. Ooh. Let's see it. Uh, okay. Um, so I can see this deck two different ways. Either there's a power turn on three, um, Cerebro three, or interestingly, because of the way this deck can assemble itself, there isn't a power turn. Okay. Um, because, you know, if I get, you know, if I don't get Cerebro on my draw until, like, say, turn five, I can do a two drop and then a Cerebro on five. And then sixth, I can do a Mystique and some other three drop. Um, and there's lots of cases where even if I do have Cerebro on three, I might not want to play it. For example, if my three, I draw uh, Bast, and in my hand, I've got Wasp, Mystique, and Cerebro. It's um, much more beneficial, I think, to play Wasp, or sorry, Bast, um, and buff those three cards so that they're also going to get the benefit of Cerebro. 
So I don't know if this is okay to say, but I think there is not necessarily a power turn. I think it's great. I think it's a great way to say it. Um, so one thing there is, is it's not power turns. It's what we call power cards. Power cards mm-hmm. the same way as power turns. It's if I have it, I'm going to play the card. And for example, Cerebro is a power card. So remember when we discussed about limitations, we said a full game, unless we play magic, but we're not playing, well, we're playing magic, but we're, we're going to do without for the example. Um, a full game has 21 energies. Cerebro is a power card, meaning if I have Cerebro, I want to play it at some point. So actually, I need to build a plan with 18 energies. Because there's three that are like locked. I didn't lock a turn, but I still locked something. I locked energies. It's kind of the same way that you look at your week and you want to go to the restaurant with your wife or whatever, but she doesn't tell you a day. You don't care because you're really flexible. You're on a holiday. So you're just like, all right, just whenever you know, let me know. I'm super flexible. So you didn't lock a day, which would be our power turn, but you still locked some money to pay for a restaurant. Mm-hmm. That's the same thing here. I'm not going to lock a turn, but I know somewhere in my game, I need to pay those three energies. So if I make a plan for turn three, four, five, and six, and in these four turns, Cerebro is nowhere to be found, there's a problem with my plan. And that, is gonna, and that is going to impact deck building a different way because this is why, for example, this deck has so, so many low-cost energy, uh, low cost cards because a low-cost card is much easier to work with when I have energy that is pre-locked. If a card costs 1, that means I can play Cerebro with it on turn 4. If a card costs 2, that means I can play Cerebro with it on turn 3. If a card costs 3, I can play Cerebro with it on turn 6. But if a card costs four, five, and six, if I want to play that card, I cannot play Cerebro that turn. And so that goes against my power card. Because that means, for example, every game I want to play Valkyrie, I have to think, okay, when do I want to play Valkyrie? Usually it's six. Let's say, so my turn six is going to be Wasp Valkyrie. All right. So that means turn six cannot be Cerebro Mystique. So now if I want to do Cerebro Mystique, I need to play Cerebro on turn 4 and Mystique on 5 or gain one energy to be able to play both on 5. And this is how it works when we're working with power card instead of power turns. But it's great that you saw it and I didn't have to explain it before. I think the deck's a lot of fun. Yep. So now, if we go back to the deck building part, that mm-hmm. means if I were to include new cards, what would I be looking for? Outside three power cards, obviously. Well, then, um, I would say you would be looking for better tech that costs more than three um, or easier to duplicate cards that cost less than three. You know, it's not really text, but you need, if you look for cards that cost more than three, they need to be lane winning. Like they need to be strong mm-hmm. enough mm-hmm. that they can win without Cerebro. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you're kind of locked at three because as long as a card costs three, she's not against the ability to play Cerebro. Mm-hmm. Which is why, for example, Armor is really good to include, Cosmo is really good to include. The first tech card we generally include in Cerebro is Killmonger and Shadow King because they both cost three. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And why uh, Crystal has never been played in that deck when she costed four. Well, she was a 4-4, but she's so much better as a 3-3 because now, even if I have Cerebro in my hand, I can still do Cerebro's Crystal on turn six. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Really good one. Not for long. Do you want Patriot or do you want Inchina? Let's do Inshinak. All right. 
Right. Um, so talking core cards again. Well, the goal um, here is not I... to identify the core cards, is to identify the points where we're not flexible, which typically are the core cards. Okay. Um, so I think at least my answer is the last two turns, um, but if we're excluding magic, five, six. Okay. Well, you can do it just like a um, tribunal, like we did before. Okay. Um, then five, six, seven are kind of okay. where your game plan is kind of developed, where um, you're going to want to flow energy one of the turns, either f um, five or six, and then play She-Hulk, Hulk, or Infinite on the last turn. Yes. Um, turn five, if you're not floating energy and you have the extra turn, um, leeches also would be part of kind of the turn five, six, seven. Okay. I think everything else in the deck is flexible, at least in what turn to play it. So right now, what the cards that are not flexible are Leech, She-Hulk, Hulk, Infinite? Yep. Then I have a problem. Would it be... Oh, is it Cyclops again on turn four? No, but how can oh, Hulk Evo. not be... Yeah. Why can we play Hulk? Oh, did I not? Um, we can play Hulk on turn six. No, not when. Or Wh seven. Why is Hulk interesting with this deck? Like, what makes it a good card in this deck? I guess I'm not entirely sure. I mean, besides it, it, it being big. Yeah, yeah, but that's what makes it big. High evolutionary? Yeah, so she's not flexible either. Oh, yes, but you're never playing it, so the turn doesn't change. It doesn't matter, because our goal is to identify where we're not flexible in the game, because then that tells us where we are flexible with our deck building. If we're, okay. if we're oh, not okay. flexible regarding Hulk, it's because it's evolved. So in order for this card to be important, this one has to be in the deck. Okay, that makes sense. And so that would include magic and sunspot. For example, as I, well. I can make it much more obvious. Let's take this deck and let's say I remove the collector. Do you still play Loki? Probably not. If, or I, I mean, I guess with Quinja, it still has some merit, but you're losing a lot of the power in the deck. That's the exact same idea. If the collector is not flexible, Loki isn't either. Okay. Because they work together. So here is the same idea. Some cards have conditions. And if the condition is another card then both are inflexible. Okay, so the high evolutionary, um, I guess, leech spot, I've seen other things there, but some sort of five drop, the Hulk's infinite magic and sunspot are kind of inflexible spots okay. why in the sun deck. Why sunspot? Um, more than the other deck, this deck wants to take an entire turn off, and so it changes how you use your energy. Exactly. Like, honestly, I'm not sure this deck would exist without Sunspot because suddenly passing for She-Hulk would be a pain. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same relationship. Yeah. Hulk exists because I evolutionary. She-Hulk probably exists because of Sunspot. So that means when we're, when we're going to try to adapt our deck, if we're like... Oh, I'm kind of tired with She-Hulk. I can never play her. If you remove her, you probably remove him as well. Well, um, I, I guess in this specific deck, would you still have to keep 
Sunspot because of Infinite? Because it's the same thing? Probably. But I mean, in this deck, we're never going to remove She-Hulk. It was more of the example. But yeah, you could make a case that it's Sunspot, She-Hulk, and Infinite, and they work as like a unit of three cards. Yes. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, all right, so we said the inflexible cards are here, plus Sunspot. All right, so if I were to look for cards to include in this deck, where would I be looking? We're mostly looking at turn one, turn two, and really turn three playable stuff. Mm. I, I guess you could argue turn four, but... Well, what are we doing on turn four? Um, it would be Cyclops. Okay, but then if we're if Cyclops represents our go to on turn four, why is turn one flexible when we have Sunspot that you put as inflexible? Uh, because we have Hulk in the deck. Oh, okay, that makes sense. All right, so yeah, turn two and three are the most flexible ones. And with this deck is pretty obvious because if you look at it, this is where the tech cards are. Like, literally, if Marvel Snap was a game which you could play with 10 cards, you'd probably remove Armor and Cosmo and just build a super reliable deck. And it's true for a lot of decks. When you look at them and you spot the tech cards, usually they're made to fill in the blanks where the deck didn't have natural, like, synergy cards to include. Oh, that is such a good way to look at that. Well, you can figure out the flexible turns based on um, the cost of the tech cards. And that's good that we're finishing uh. with Patriot Surfer because that's exactly what it does. Like, Patriot Surfer bread and butter is Forge into Brood into Absorbing Man, and it supports it with Patriot and Surfer. So I got two, three, four, and six. Well, guess what? My flexible card is Legion, and it's a five. And if I don't get Legion, I can still play Blue Marvel. And if I don't get any of these two, I can still try to get them with Iron Lad. Or, and that's why the second tech card is a two, because my turn six is usually going to be a double three, I can build a five with two plus three. And this is the role of flexible and tech cards. They have to fit the team of the deck. Here... The team of the deck is turn 2, 3, and 4 are locked. So I need to work turn 5, or I need to work turn 5, or I need to work turn 6. Or, if I don't get these, I can still work like turn 6, like this, or like this. And this is how I would spot the flexible turns. I kind of skipped the power turn spot and everything, just to skip it to the conclusion. But that would be... The way to do it. All right. Perfect. It was an hour exactly. We can have our usual break. Um, after the break, uh, do you guys have decks that you want us to look at and try to do the same exercise? Except this time, we're going to try to build the deck instead of taking a deck that is already like done and kind of a finished product do you do you guys have like concepts that you're working on or like ideas that you would want to that you would want to refine deck building with um and so all i'm thinking with the release of alias tomorrow um trying to build we can a sandman deck sure we can okay. definitely look at that all right, as usual, let's have like, so it's uh, midnight 04 for me. Let's say we have a six minute break, come back at 10. Sounds good. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, All right. Sounds good. All right, see you then.
You're back. I am. I'm here. Oh, not for long left, or did you just have a technical problem? Uh, I mean, he was going to propose a deck, so I'm hoping he's coming back. Oh, he didn't say anything before he left? No, it just uh, disappeared. Okay, well, let's just hope it's a longer break than expected. All right. Well, I mean, do, do you have a deck that you want us to look at? I mean, so I, I've been having a lot of fun with um, this card, but it doesn't really fit the theme of the day, so it'd be fun to try to build maybe some Eliath um, decks. All right. So, let's start with the basic. So here, we're going to assume Eliath is the power turn. Is that mm -hmm. the idea that we want to push? So... How are we looking at the card and we're like, how, what's the setup? Like, what is a, a situation that you would guess is good to play this card? Because a power turn is a turn that's particularly good. So how do we make this card particularly good? My first thought would be pair it with wave. Okay. Why? Well, so we want this to win a lane or to flip a lane that they were expecting to win but you can try to compete in multiple lanes in this game so wave is something that would force them to commit to a certain they can only play in one lane for example um okay but how is it not a one out of three for us like what makes well, it that we're not just playing like a, i don't know casino with this we could pair it with other uh, cards that make um, lanes undesirable. Like we could do Cosmo to block off one lane. Um, we could do Professor mm. X to block off a lane. So I like Professor X, but Cosmo, you have to think about one. If we're in Conquest and they know you're playing Alias, Cosmo can play against you because they because mm -hmm. they know that's safe now. Mm -hmm. Hello, ah, not for long. Uh, yes, I'm um, still working on some internet issues, but I am here by phone. Uh, okay, well, we started going on Elioth, and uh, we're, we're following Silverman's train of thought, and his train of thought is wave, so the opponent is limited in what they can do, and we were looking for ways to limit where the opponent can play, so we can try to make Elioth as reliable as possible and not just make it a one out of three. Makes sense. So right now we're on Professor X and we were discussing how Cosmo can be a way to limit what the opponent does, but can also be a way to tell the opponent if you play there, Elioth can't hurt you. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, do we have other ideas? I mean, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Fantastic, if we're with Alioth trying to play priority, I, are, are we still in the space limiting? We can go different directions, it's okay, but how is priority important? Because Alioth is going to kill them no matter what. So, wh why is it important that we have priority? Yeah. Um, the only thing to be countered, but. I think that's a little bit less relevant than knowing what lane that we're putting Ali off in. Okay. Uh, there is one card that I personally really like if we're talking about you have to play somewhere specific. And her name is Jean Grey. Mm. I mean, Wave plus Jean Grey tells the opponent you can only play one card and you have to play it here. That sounds very Elliot to me. Oh, that's great and annoying. <laughs> the question is, how do we do it? Like, how do we get to that setup? Because we have Profex, we have this. Uh, how do we get there? Because right now we have... Okay, we, so we have the, the power turn on six. We mm -hmm. have a way to lock... We have two ways to lock. We have a way to limit mana. Like, we, we don't have a deck right now, so... I don't know. I, I feel like Jean Grey 
competes with Professor X a bit because a great play would be um, um, Jean Grey plus a two cost on five. Well, then she also competes with Wave because I thought you wanted to play Wave on five. Hmm. Unless you play Wave earlier and you're just like... But then if you play Wave earlier, you need to get your lock set up earlier as well. Mm-hmm. 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 So we're asking how to make Jean Grey work? Well, we don't need to make Jean Grey work. We just play Jean Grey, and if the lane isn't full on turn 5, we just Wave, and we tell the opponent, this is where you have to play. And then we can mm-hmm. just at that lane. I don't know if it's good. Like, right now, we're just throwing ideas. Like, if we want a very simple deck for Elliot, we'll just play Galactus, let's be honest. Yeah, true. But, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll show you one of the examples. I'll, I'll assume you haven't checked my Twitter today. Uh, do I have it? Yes, I have it. So this is what I built with Elliot. I don't know if that's very visible. Okay. Ooh. Oh, oh, okay. So, does anyone have an idea of what I'm trying to do with this? You're trying to play Eliath on 5 with Mr. Negative. Uh, no. No. Oh, no. I may be cheating because I saw the post, but Uh, Ali offered to go off. Ah, yes. Oh, oh. So, so the idea is why pick a lane when you can reveal Eliot everywhere at once? Zola, oh. costs, Zola costs zero when it's negative, so you just play Elliot and you Zola it, and it reveals everywhere. So, I don't need to lock anything, play wherever you want, I'm gonna Elliot every lane. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it really is great. Alright, but... It's gonna be very frustrating to play. That, that's one idea. Okay, that's one idea. And okay. l- let's do what we did. So, obviously, Mr. Negative is a power turn. Like, I, I have play it. Um, <laughs> then we have, obviously, turn five or six, I would guess. If I'm really lucky... No, can it be turn five ever? Yeah, it can be turn five if I get negative on turn three. And then I managed to draw Zola and Elioth, um back to back. I mean, I could Crystal on four and I get one more turn. Uh, but it's going to be really rare I get to pull this on five. So let's say it's turn six. So I got three or four and five or six, which are locked. Um, so that leaves me with two, three, four? No. One well, doesn't, one doesn't exist. Two? If you have Zabu or Psylocke, you're playing it on two because you got to negative on three. Mm-hmm. Yes, probably. Where are my flexible? T- I guess it's no flex. Like I don't really have any flexible turns. It's really very draw dependent. Because then I also have the other combo, which is uh, if I don't have Elliot, I just Black Panther Zola, and that's like one is disruption, the other one is points. Um, I mean, five feels pretty flexible of the most options because it's too late to play negative, and it's probably too early to play out your hand. Well, the thing is, I, other uh, can they really include? Because I already have two five costs in my uh, in my deck. So even if 5 is flexible, can I really work anything with turn 5? I mean, you can Magic, Crystal, Wong, Black Panther, and Iron Man on 5. Uh, yes, I have Wong, Black Panther, Zola. So like, that's, that's the alternate plan, for sure. Hmm. So if that's the alternate plan... Do we ever play Echo in this? Because I don't have a one, so maybe that's a point where we could think about it, where we're like, all right, 
We have a turn one, and that sets up Wong, Black Panther, or Zola. Although it's bad because then Zola can copy Echo instead of copying Panther, and then I want to cry. Uh, yeah, let, let's try the thing. Yeah, I... Are there actually any flexible cards in this? Or am I forced? Like, let's say, because when, when we were testing ideas, it's really important to know what can and cannot change because that tells you how much room you have to work around the idea. Like, so let's take the two extremes. Let's imagine I make this deck and I realize I have zero flexible cards. Like, if it's not these 12, the idea doesn't work. That means I'm kind of in an all-in situation. Either it works or it doesn't. Like, okay. Now let's take the other extreme. It's never going to be 12 flexible cards, but let's say I could work out nine flexible cards. My deck is just negative Zola, Elioth. Uh, all right, let's say Psylocke as a core card. So let's say I have eight flexible cards. Then even if my idea doesn't work, I have... A million ways that I can adapt it, try to include new cards and everything. In this one, I think we're closer to the first case because first, I need to have cards with lower power than they have their cost. And two, I'm, I feel like I'm very locked from turn four and on because unless I cheat Mr. Negative, which makes my turn four basically become my turn three, so it's just a swap, basically. Like, mm. my turn five is almost always going to be Black Panther or Iron Man, except if I have negative. And my turn six is almost always going to be Elliot or Zola. And if I have negative, it's going to be both. So, where is the flexibility here? Like, are, am I forced that is these 12 cards that have to work? Or, like, can I remove, I don't know, can... Is Black Panther removable? Is Wong removable? I mean, maybe Ironheart could be something else. It, it's probably the best thing, but you could definitely make an argument for it being some other card that functions well in the negative package slash I mean, we've, seen, we've, I seen, can... we've seen Jane Foster in the past. But personally, since her buff, I like Crystal more. Because Crystal helps both before and after negative. While Jen Foster only helps after. And also, Elliot took the spot of all. So there's one less zero, co uh, zero power card in the deck. Hmm. Do we need seven turns with this? Is it important to have seven turns, or could we work something out with Matt? I mean, I think with negative, your, your draws are so much better than your opponent's. That if you get one more, it gets you one closer to a five power zero cost Iron Man. Are we in a deck where we cannot change a card? Which is both really good and really bad. It's really good because that means we get to test probably one of the best way to build a deck. Which, I mean, Mr. Negative exists it's forever. It's not like I nailed it the first time. I just changed one card in the deck. Uh, but at the same time, if this doesn't work, it's literally like deck goes to the closet, and we just reopen it again when we get another card that works with Mr. Negative. Because I don't think Elliot can go into the surfer build of Mr. Negative. It has to be this one or zero. Alright, let, let's go over the cards then. So, Zabu, I don't think we can cut. Psylocke, I don't... Can we? Can we cut Psylocke? I really like well... Psylocke, because it opens a lot of combos if we get it with Wong and stuff. Part of why this looks so inflexible is that you've got a pair of cards that are both trying to do kind of the same thing. So Crystal and um, uh, Magic, in a way, are both trying to get us more draws. 
Um, Zabu Tellak are both trying to get negative out earlier. Um, so we could swap out some cards, but we always lose reliability. Yeah, so we, if we were to swap one out, we need the lost reliability to be compensated with, like, incredible power. Back to deck builder. Uh, power. All right. Is there a card that would be, like, so good that would be worth the investment? I mean, Taskmaster on Black Panther is something. Uh, there was a time people were playing Shuri in this deck, weren't they? Is that any good? What would we do with Shuri in there? It's only Black Panther. Because there's no point going Shuri on Iron Man. He already Shuri's himself, basically. And every card in the lane. Shuri on Zola? Does that ever work? Like, you play Shuri, you play Zola, and then the cards that you're gonna play on the other lane also get buffed? Is that a combo? Like, we just Shuri all three lanes? Do we have enough to make that work? I mean, the Shuri plan only sounds like it works if you already did your Mr. Negative plan. Because yeah, you're gonna want to play three cards where everything else is either making your negative plan happen or has some utility outside the plan itself. There is one card that we could consider, which I like in Mr. Negative in general, especially with Black Panther, it's Wolf's Bane, which can be like a backup Black Panther. Because we'd want... Would that be better than Ironheart? It's better with Zola, because basically the idea is with Wong, it becomes a 13, and then you Zola it, and it reveals again, and it can grow to like a 15, or like, or like, I think top, it's a 19. And it's basically like duplicating Black Panther. Like, it's a second Black Panther. But it can only be replaced by Ironheart. The thing is, Iron Heart with Wong already helps the other lanes without Zola. Wolfsbane needs Zola. And then it really, really makes a deck where you have to negative Zola every single game for it to work. Mm. White Tiger is not a bad card either. And that's a decent Zola target. Wait, Patriot is all... Is there a deck with, like, White Tiger, Patriot, and Negative that exists? What costs... Are... I haven't seen one. Oh, but that seems interesting. <laughs> what costs are the Tigers? Seven Power Tiger, okay. What's the... Oh, it's five, seven. Oh, it's a five? I don't know if that ever that even do we have other cards we could buff? I mean rude. Okay, yeah, it works with negative. Uh good FP. I mean Mystique works. I mean then you'd probably want to play Surfer. What are we buffing? Patriot and... Oh, yeah. Brood and Mystique. So... But then, don't we end up going to... Doesn't that become yes. just... Patriot Surfer? You have Patriot Surfer. Are you already on it? A... I mean, I guess the only difference is if you add negative to it, I, I mean, I guess adding Patriot allows you to play White Tiger. So it would be this. There's already Surfer. There's already Brood. Do you remove you, 
Probably Rogue, yeah. Ghostbane then? Or Ironheart? But then the idea of White Tiger was to Zola it to get a lot of tigers. Because, like, here, does mm. Patriot make any sense? What does he buff? He buffs White Tigers and he buffs Brood. That's it. Is that ever enough? Doesn't feel like it's enough. Well, anyway, we got really Is there any me. other... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Is there any other knowability cards that would be even reasonable to invert? Yeah, there's no ability. Uh, yeah, doesn't work. Well, Wasp is really bad when negative, but we could just play it before. Yeah. Like, if we guess, we draw it early. I mean, everything with low power is an ability, otherwise it makes no sense. Yeah, no, no. Anyway, we got really far from the Elliot idea right now. We're working. Okay, let's go back to Elliot. I mean, one thing I've been thinking about um, is if we're still on the idea of choking off lanes, um, Goose um, yeah. is but pretty solid because... Sorry, go ahead. It's same idea. They know you where you play Elliot. Because you can't goose. Well, you can't play it on goose. Yeah, so what it means is that, um, you know, goose is going to um, either, you know, they can't get a lot of points in the final turn um, on that lane. Um, so we're already kind of shifting them to prioritizing the other two lanes. Okay. I'm also wondering if something like a Magneto as a that card could be useful here, but only with magic. Um, or wave, I guess. Um, um, because it would let us move their Cosmo around. Are the goblins good? Could we go junkier? Oh... Yeah, just feel the oh. same. Oh, Elias, the last one. That's fun. Oh, okay. So now it's almost like an uh, like a a viper, goblin, a tuma kind of deck. Yeah. Uh, well, huh. we probably shouldn't play a tuma because we want to play armor, and we wouldn't want to play armor with Elias. But. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's keep the junk idea. I feel like this one almost looks like a, a Thanos deck. To because we want to play Professor X early. Well, then, Claw is another way to win an Elias lane. Um, if played to the left, I mean. Yeah, but then. Spectrum's a good sex. Sorry, what? Oh, Spectrum's a good sex of kind of a counter of Alioth. Alioth goes sort of tall in one lane where Spectrum goes really wide. Yeah, but then that's more of a counter deck rather than how do we tell it? Because I guess we could just build like kind of a Thanos deck, which is a low curve, so it's not that annoyed with Goose. You can Professor X on turn 4. And then once you have the lane under control, you just set up Elliot and win. And the deck doesn't have really good 6 anyway. And that would be a really good target for Iron Ladder. Jean Grey is good in the Thanos deck. Jean Grey works as well, but I'm taking a basic, like, Nuss list. And there's uh, I guess there will be more. Cool. 
The problem well, is most of the time he played armor and cozy window. Could it be yeah. like a Thanos gas kind of killmonger carnage? Hmm. No. I mean, if we're doing that and we've got a wave in there, um, we could do an Eliath on five and then drop a Nimrod on it or something. Um, scatter that around. Like, we can use Eliath to destroy some cards for us. Uh, no, because it's all enemy cards. Oh, wait. Ah, oh, shoot. All right. <laughs> uh, but okay, let's go for the... For the destroy one. Uh, I mean, X-23 lets us play Null into Elias, which probably wins two lanes. Mm. Well, then I almost want to try Negasonic. Um, we can start destroying multiple cards of theirs. Just prevent them from getting off the ground. Could be. So what are we including? We're including Yondu, I'm guessing, because we have no uh, Carnage, Ven Monger. We want Bucky Barnes or Wolverine. I'm guessing we do. Um, but we have four destroys for Wolverine. Uh, one. We have three. Okay. And then I kind of want to keep the Prof X idea because we still have the Greenstone and uh, X23 to get it out on 4. Yeah, that sounds great. Makes our alley off much better to pick between two lanes. Mm -hmm. Either that or the wave idea. One or the other. I don't know what would be better between Prof X and wave. Okay, so that would be one deck. And so where would we be flexible with this? Because the problem with the destroy synergy is not really flexible. I guess Prof X is the flexible card in there. You can play around with that slot. Is Yandu flexible? It helps with Null, but does it help with a lot of other things? We have the rocks and everything. We have what? that duel. Maybe we want Jeff. There's also Bucky to strain him. Because we talked about getting initiative. I mean, that's definitely the strength of the destroy decks is being able to put Bucky Barnes, Wolverine, and stuff. It tends to be a little bit faster than a lot of decks. We could also which we can capitalize on that with. Do it like this. I mean, still kills X20. Wolverine kills a lot of like kills the stones and I don't know if it's good now. I mean if we do something like a Shuri four, Death Strike five, and then another lane Elias. Um well, we need to... that's a fun way to The thing is you're going to sacrifice turn four and five for the same lane. So it means you need to have a lane yeah. where you're at max four points behind. Mm -hmm. And also, even if you destroy a lot of stuff, you only got ten points there. Like, I mean, most six costs can take the lane back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, but that, that was the destroy idea with, like, these two cards. Basically, that's the core, and then you have two flexible slots. Uh... Do we want to work on the junk idea? I think that's a lot of fun. All right, so yeah. the junk idea was Elliot. What else do we have? Do we want Galactus in the junk idea? Or are we going to feel our side of the board too and it's going to be too much? I mean, Galactus is always like a good flex threat if we don't draw exactly debris. Well, there's more than that because we need to play cards still. The question is like, 
If we don't get Elias, what's our alt win condition? Is it just like a Luke Cage Azmat combo? Is it just points like I don't know, Spider Woman, Titania? Is it Galactus? Is uh this goblin for sure? We want this one. I know we mentioned Viper and Viper. Most of the time we have to run Chavez in those decks to get Hood and Viper together reliably. Do we want Nebula? Because that forces them to play somewhere. Oh, yeah, in, that sounds in, good. In those decks we have to play Armor though. Because otherwise Destroy demolishes the whole point of the deck. We'll just not play them on the same line. If we've uh, got... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm thinking of the, the cards that would... Do we want... um, Destroyer? Sorry, go ahead. Destroyer? I mean, if we played in the... um, You know, if we could play... Uh, fill our armor lane and then play Destroyer outside of it. Um... More like, are we going to have enough? Because usually if we're able to fill a lane, fight a woman is almost as good as destroy. Fair enough. Sure, also yeah, no. kind of thinks Cosmo. Or you're also... Oh, needs Cosmo. Ah. Yeah. Which stops Alley off as well. This be a Valkyrie deck? I mean, we would have to lean a little away from the goblins and stuff, but. Oh, wait. So let's let's start with the cards that we know we need. Because there's another way to lock a lane. We could play Doctor Octopus. Oh, that's fun. If we're gonna do Octopus and um, maybe Hobgoblin, I start wanting Daredevil. Uh, good. Go for Doctor Octopus. Is Ghost Spider good? What? Octopus? Yeah. Then can we play... But we want to drop a on Styx. Well, Eliath is another mm. way to win the contested lane. Because basically, Junk should win a lane by just killing it with Junk. And then he needs to win another lane. Looking at ways to win. And Dr. Octopus is okay because it's a lot of points hard. I kinda like Titania because it pairs well with Octopus. But usually there's also Spider Woman in there. Hmm. Do we want Carnage in the deck? Help with our junk? Like the rocks, but if we well, we've got Viper to throw something around. Um, you know, if we just have a couple rocks, it's not as bad for us. Um, well, then do we want... Armor, so they can destroy their stuff. I mean, if we're... We just have us in it. Liability. Hmm. Yeah, Shavas also lets us plan if we're Aliasing or not. So I feel like drawing it on turn 6, since it needs set up. Hmm, hmm. Are we... Doing something like um, 
you know, toxic. Um, if so, um, could be fun to absorbing man debris. Um, well, then that's kind of a different deck because we need three spots, right? And also, it kind of conflicts with Elia because that means you need to Azmat early on. I mean, mm -hmm. we could we could look cage Azmat on four absorbing men on five. Wait, actually, we're talking about absorbing men, but can't we copy that bad boy? We play it early on. How are we playing it early? Oh, so like if we did wave, Eliath, and then Absorbing Man kind of thing? Yeah, something like that. Is it silly to think Tamidi also played Doom? Well, we're not... This is not a deck that looks to spread power around. It looks to target specific. Because let's think about it. so we have multiple six. We have Elioth, and then we have oh. Titania or the Demon plus Octopus or Spider Woman. So the six is covered. The five is covered. And yeah. we also have like a debris plus viper too. You know, if we don't oh. four is kinda open, we only have sentry. I'm kinda wondering do we want Carnage as the last card because we still have like rocks. Entry stuff like that, maybe not. The four seems like a flexible turn. Three, is there a card that can compete with these? And we also have like Hood plus Viper turn. One is Nebula. I guess it's turn two that's looking very flexible because unless we get Hood into Viper, we don't have anything specific. Like, we have options for almost every turn. Like turn one, we have two options. Turn three, we have two options. Turn four, we have like this, and then we can also like debris or green goblin plus Titania if we want to, or we can the demon from the hood plus one of these two. Five, we have two options. Six, we have two options. It's really turn two where we don't have many options. You know, if we're looking for another turn four, um. Just a tech card like Shang or um, Enchantress based on what they're playing. But rarely, I guess, will they have things that on that turn are killable. Um, so, no. Um, I mean, Enchantress yeah. could be, but I don't think Shang is needed because the idea with this deck is that we're supposed to lock early on. Like, we're supposed to get a lane mm -hmm. by turn four. We should know if we're going to win that lane. Because we already it's... had, like, a goblin, a hood, stuff like that. And we should know we're going to win it. So the idea is then, our opponent is forced to win the other two. Yeah. And if they're going to play a big card on one of these two, then we'll just play Elliot on the other one. I feel like we don't so... need to kill the big thing. Because yeah. we already have a lane yeah. under control. We just play on the other lane. So why not something like an Echo? If we're going to drop it on what will eventually be our life lane, it will prevent them from Cosmoing or Armoring, um, which guarantees our life goes off. I, I like those cards. I'm just worried about... like Because if we add something that's like a one cost or something that gets destroyed, mm -hmm. we're basically saying destroy just beats us. And that's just the life of this deck and we just like destroy is just mm -hmm. a one cube loss every time mm -hmm. but then if we add like another one cost how much just just killmonger yeah then i guess carnage makes sense because if we misfire a viper they fill a lane or something like that it just repairs the damage In a way, Carnage almost works like a Daredevil. It's a two-cost that lets us um, make sure our tricks don't hurt us instead. Yeah. I think in yeah. the two-cost, I'm looking at Carnage or Armor. 
Armor makes sure they can't get rid of our tricks, and Carnage makes sure we can get rid of ours. Like, they're kind of the opposite. One helps us, the other one makes sure the opponent can't help himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, we said... It... It... Go ahead. If we play armor, would Polaris be good? That we can shift the stone and FUD into one... our armored lane? I have one big problem with Polaris. I think Polaris is a really good junk card. But I have one big problem in the current metagame is Collector. If you move Collector to that lane, you didn't lock anything because Collector could beat you alone. Mm. And, Angela is, and, and Angela is kind of the same. Like Right now, there are a lot of two costs that are able to grow enough that alone they could deny the junk part of the lane. Like, Collector plus a Rock plus Green Goblin plus Hood, I'm not even sure I'm winning that lane. So we're looking for a, a 4, or are we looking for a 2? Whatever. Like, we said these are our two most flexible turns. Because turn 1 is always going to be Nebula or Hood if we have one of them. We have double 3, double 5, and double 6 with, like, Elias or a 5 and 1. Or four is sentry, or it's like a three plus one that's a little far fetched because Nebula is bad on four. Has to be early Titania or Hood, or like the demon from the Hood. So it's more conditions. And two right now is is Viper. Get Hood into Viper. But yeah, I feel like turn two and four are the two most flexible turns where we don't have many things to do. Uh. I guess we don't have to or two. Like it's just cheap call. Because it could also be a turn one that we would pair with debris or goblin. But it makes Kelmonger that for I mean it could be a bunny maw. We could a bunny maw viper it. Oh. <laughs> it's actually a fun way to fill a lane. Yeah. Um and lock them out of it. Yeah. yeah. Um I don't know. Well, that's where deck building gets interesting. If we knew everything, we'd be done already. Right? Yeah, the sessions <laughs> would the sessions would be fifteen minutes. That's right. Mm. Um, I don't. I'm just looking at interesting four costs. Like I could see an argument. Well, not if we're doing debris. Um, I was thinking warpath maybe, but um, no. Um, I mean, Jeff is always good as a... Is Snow Guard just thinking of flexibility that... I think I would replace Nebula for Snow Guard. At least Snow Guard does fit more or less anywhere in the curve, but Nebula might just be the power that the deck needs. And also Nebula entices them to play somewhere, which is what we want. We want them to play. It could be both. Like, I mean, the good thing with Snowguard is if Snowguard gets Killmongered, it's not that big of a problem. And Snowguard actually gives us a four if we play both cards. Uh, could be Snowguard. Could be Snow Guard. All right, we have a uh, one uh, one possibility. We already talked about Dagger, uh, about Carnage, Dark Devil. Where are we on Dark Devil? Oh, actually, we could also play Goose. Like Nebula into Goose isn't so bad. That's that's a two we could explore. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, would we want to just play Storm? Oh. Because the Collector deck wants to play Collector on turn two, so that means our turn three, we just don't pick that lane. Yes, but how often do we play Storm on turn three? Like, if you have Storm and Debris on turn three, which one are you playing? Mm-hmm. Or if you have Goblin Storm on turn 3, which one are we playing? Like, Storm is a card that 
takes over all your other tree costs because unless we also play Legion or something like that, Storm is a turn tree card. And we already have two cards that we really want to play on turn tree. Difficult. Good job. Good. Point. Black Widow, they have to play a zero cost somewhere. They have to play the fight. Black Widow is also not terrible to throw over, it being only. It's also a spot. So good Viper target. Maybe Black Widow is better than Sentry. A Sentry is really only good with Viper. Ah, maybe we can make a more flexible deck. Is that more flexible? We don't necessarily need Sentry for points, because we have Elias that's been added to the mix. And now we're much more flexible. Oh. And now, actually, isn't Absorbing Man a really good four? Because we also have the Black Widow copy. Mm-hmm. How good is that? It's also not a terrible backup in case we don't get the, you know, six we want. Yeah, I mean, with Spider Woman, we can oh, go yeah. Spider Woman on five, and then Titanium Absorbing Man for Do we have an quite a bit of power. Do we have a Marvel Snap Zone Premium Alias deck? <laughs> does anyone see like an obvious problem with this deck? Like, does anyone see like, oh my god, this doesn't work? Because then we can obviously switch up. Killmonger? Well, is Killmonger that bad? Because he's gonna kill Hood. He's gonna kill T Nebula. But Titania sh should stay in our hand long enough. It'll kill the rocks, the rocks from armor. debris. I mean, yeah, this, rocks from debris. This is why we mentioned armor. How many decks are running kill? Oh, what would we cut for armor? Oh, actually, like we said, Alias is really good with Galactus. Doesn't do this dunk on Galactus? Is it junk like one of the biggest counter to Galactus? So we would have an Elias deck that actually beats the most popular Elias deck. <laughs> that would be fun. Okay, let, let's say, let's assume the metagame doesn't change too much. Which, we'll see. But let's assume the metagame doesn't change too much. So, I'll pass a silent performance. So, Shuri does not play Killmonger. Problem with Shuri is they don't actually need that much space. Like, they could beat us with three mm -hmm. cards. Mm -hmm. But that's all right. Ella Tribunal, actually, I think we're okay against them because their invisible woman lane is going to fill up real quick. If they get to, like, if they play invisible woman on turn two, I'm pretty sure by the time they want to play Modoc, we can almost fill the lane. Loki Collector. Be good into Loki Collector. But at the same time... I mean, time, the I... conversation we had last week was space. True. Okay, we might have mm -hmm. something. All right. And they don't play Collector. Evolve Doom Wave, we don't care that much. Like, we can try to lock their space, and then they play Wave on 5, and we just take the 50-50 or the 33% of it. It's not that bad. Cerebro Tree? Cerebro Tree. Cerebro Tree plays Valkyrie, um, which is a big problem for him. Yeah, but Viper can be easy to kill Cerebro 3. You just take one of your high cards and give it to them. Back or Titania, or Spider Woman. Yep. Yeah, okay. Cerebro Tree is not a problem. Patriot Surfer. Yeah. Patriot Surfer can and can and can be really good or really bad. I guess it's very out based. Because we can really make their life miserable if they brood absorbing men. Because literally if they brood absorbing men, we can say like, alright, you're not playing the game. 
Like you're out of space. So if they look just side by side, so if they get their perfect, you know, forge brood absorbing man, does our two, three, four? Well, it, can like, we? If they get so their perfect ahead. outs, mm-hmm. and we get ours, you just hood viper one lane, mm-hmm. and then once you know where they hood, you just put Titania there. So you fill the lane, and mm-hmm. then on turn six you just take it back, and they can't play on that mm-hmm. lane for the rest of the game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then the other thing is, most of the time, what's gonna happen is they're gonna brood an absorbing man, and then it's really easy to know that they're gonna play in the remaining lane. So Alias mm-hmm. is almost a surefire. I'm gonna kill something. Mm-hmm. And usually, what happens is they tend to play Patriot and Surfer on the bad lane, the one they don't intend to win. So if you can snipe it with Alias, you kill both. That's absolutely. And for that, do you need? Um, priority because uh, we wanted to attack their unrevealed cards. Um, well, you don't care for like Patriots, was... you do care for Surfer. Yeah. But yeah, pay- priority with this deck is going to be really different. That's probably the biggest weakness of the deck is I don't think we're going to have priority that often. Because we're working with the opponent's board, we're not working with ours. And Patriot could be annoying regarding the rocks. But I'm not too worried about it. All right, so this one could be difficult. Is she not? I, I think Dr. Octopus is really good against Is she not? Is it really good or really bad? Well, I mean, with Dr. Octopus, at least in this matchup, we just give up on a lane. And if we pull what they skip their turn for... Yeah, but the thing is, you give up on the lane on turn 5... But if they got Sunspot Cyclop on another lane, how do you win this one? Because usually the deck still is really good on one lane already, which is the Sunspot, Misty Knight, Nebula, Armor, Cosmo, whatever lane. And then their big cards allows us to attack the second one. So that means there's one of these two that we need to take from them. And I don't know where to Okay, yeah. I don't think we're making enough points to do that. But actually, like, we were worried about Killmonger, and the first deck with Killmonger is Sarah Surfer. So actually, like, a lot of the popular decks are not playing Killmonger. So that's not that big of a consideration in the end. And Destroy is really, really bad right now, because in addition to Armor, a lot of decks have, been, have started playing um, Shadow King for uh, the Collector, and Shadow King is really bad for Deadpool and Venom. I honestly like the look of this deck. I think it's not so bad. It might lack, like, raw power. But I think the concept is okay. Like, we, we made something that it's, it's flexible in the turns. It's... But... I think deck building-wise, there's not, like, an obvious problem. Apart from... It might lack points. But if that kind of strategy was able to put up a lot of points, Marvel Snap would be broken. If you're able to just tell your opponent you don't have space and beat them on points, the best they can. It's interesting to think about how Eliath mirror matches would go. Because they both want to do the exact same turn six. And depending on which lanes they pick, that could just be a wash. So how you develop the early um, turns is really going to determine how a mirror match works. And I think this has some advantages for the mirror match. Well, it depends. What are, Plus, you, ca- like, what are you calling a mirror match? Because I'm pretty sure people are not going to play junk with Elliot on day one. Fair, fair, fair. Um, well, I'm... so for example... Uh, go ahead. No, I, like we already discussed, Like I'm sure... Galactus should be good for us. Yeah, yeah. What are the other Elliot deck that you expect? Electro Ramp or the um, or the Elias? I in definitely Zola, think a ramp. Uh, the, the Professor X Ramp could be annoying because they rely on playing big cards, but the thing is, because they play big cards, 
we're not that worried about like getting our cards countered. Like once they are mm-hmm. in electro mode, you know Green Goblin is safe to play. You know debris is safe to play in that kind of stuff. Yeah. And plus also... Doctor Sorry. Go ahead. No no please. I was just gonna say like and also debris is insane at uh, annoying Arnim Zola. So if they try to go for to go for Elias into Arnim Zola, you're pretty sure they're Elias lane is not gonna be empty with our deck, so at best they get a 50-50. Mm-hmm. Like we'll we'll fit something. We'll we'll throw something with Viper, we'll throw a goblin, we'll debris, we'll we'll Doctor Octopus the lane. We're gonna do something that their Zola is it's gonna be a 50-50 on the Elliot at best. I was also thinking that Doc Ock is fun for something like a what some some deck that's playing Goliath. Because if you can pull it that turn. Yeah, it kills your Dr. Ox, but it means they don't have their big whammy for turn six. Yes and no. Because if we're talking about Electro Ramp, a lot of the time you got a Doom in that deck, you got a Zola in that deck. So a lot of the time it's really where they're going to impact only that lane. Like if you're unlucky, you pull Doom and Odin and suddenly you're just like, all right, I'm 10, <laughs> I'm 10 points behind on every lane. What the hell have I done? Yes. So... The the idea looks really good, but don't underestimate the ability of a Doctor Doom or a Zola to just create a board that you had no idea could be possible. I wonder. No, okay. Is Doctor Octopus just not the right choice in the meta? Because hard to know. there's not a lot of things, huh? It's really hard to know, to be honest. But yeah, it could be one of the flexible cards. I... For sure, like, Spider-Woman feels safer. Yeah, it's at least 12 points. Opposed to not really sure, and there's a couple of lanes we can't block I with, mean, like, the, Collector yeah. insisting. The thing with Why Dr. not play Octopus, Leech? Oh, sorry. No, the thing with Dr. Octopus in this deck is that if you're in doubt about what you're going to pull, just play it on the lane you filled already. And it's just mm-hmm. gonna be a five ten. Yeah. Uh, what about leech? Yeah. So we take away the value of turn six abilities, and you know if they just play something for points, we can kill that too. I think the problem if you start playing leech is where are your points? Because like our points are basically only in these two cards, if we're being honest, and nebula early if they let it grow. If we mm-hmm. replace one of these two with Leech, we're going to have to win lanes with, like, 10 points. This is... I mean, it's too too late for now, but um, this is making me want to play around with something like an Armor, Sunspot, Nebula, She-Hulk, and then Leech Eliath, where you just grow um, lanes passively and then choke them off at the end. Isn't that called Inchinot? Yeah, okay, fair. I may have reinvented that. <laughs> <laughs> felt, felt like a very good description of the Inshinot deck on the B game plan. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> All right, but I'm happy. We got, a, we, got a, we got a creative deck. We actually got two. I, th- I think like the, the Thanos death was just, let's slot Elliot in the deck. But this one is actually like not brand new. The archetype existed, but... We had a lot of reflection around Elias and all of that, and that was the goal of today. So I'm very happy about this. I think it's a great note to go to sleep. I don't know which country <laughs> people are looking this video from, but for us Europeans, it's really late every single uh, Are there last minute questions or anything? I put the deck into the, the conversation. I am a very... Uh, very eager to try all this. I'll probably try the negative tomorrow because that just sounds too fun to pass on. But junk is uh, is something that I've always had fun with. And if I see a lot of Galacticism, I'm definitely going to try it. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for Elias. It just seems fun. Or at least plays fun decks. Yeah, like a lot, a lot of people are already on social media saying... But Loki is not going to make Elias good because they're just going to steal it from you and they're going to play it on turn 5 and etc. Okay, doesn't make me less excited about the card. Like Stuff can happen, sure, but then the meta is not 
just not going to change and we're going to keep on countering Loki and at some point people are going to be tired of it. So we will see. All right. Then uh, everyone have a good night. Thanks for joining me as usual. Uh, the next session will be in almost two weeks from now. This is why we did it so early. It's because I am going to be out from Thursday up to next Tuesday. So next session will be late next week. And I think next week is a break, isn't it? Balance-wise, at least. Not mistaken, if I follow the schedule, I think next week is a break. So probably the next session will be Ravona or we'll see. Maybe another evergreen topic. We will see about that. So on this note, everyone, have a great uh, rest of your day. And uh, hope you're having fun with Elliot tomorrow. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.